clearly the gift factory was not what Don Quixote thought it was. As it appeared to use humans as raw materials for the gifts. Let's see what happens next. After Heathcliff and Don Quixote brought death to the gnomes that attacked them, Heathcliff was angered by those fierce swords. Don Quixote saw the fault as lying with her. She didn't feel so confident now, nor was she as enthusiastic. Dante told her that they should have thought this plan through. Dante reflected that if there was someone to blame, it should be them, as the manager. They're the one that okayed it. Dante believed that they should have turned around the moment that they sensed something was off. Then Don Quixote remembered the now-abandoned sleigh. In the sacks, there were several mutilated bodies. The contents revealed as soon as she undid the knot and, well... <sighs> certainly when she untied them. Heathcliff was afraid of what they'd find in that sack. And... <sighs> He had good reasons, we afraid, as out of that sack came seven people, and they were missing a few limbs. They were barely breathing, and some were already dead. Dante didn't recognize the clothing style. Definitely not from District 21. Dante saw it as similar to that which was worn by Backstreet's residents except using materials that was unfamiliar to them. The back door sent them pretty far. Faust told them that each district within the city had different cultures, so Dante didn't have long to go over that. Heathcliff saw this as making no difference. They're dead already. And Dante can't invert time for them. They decide that they should just go back to Mephistopheles. Then Don Quixote found one that was intact. It was the one that called for help earlier. It was a white-haired child who was quite alive and largely intact. No noticeable injuries. Asking who they were. This child noted their weird-looking clothes. She guessed that they were not from the village. She was dressed in torn and faded clothing. She found them fascinating and soon got over her emotional shock. She thanked them for saving her. She introduced herself as Crayon, and then she was terrified at the sight of Dante, calling them Clockwork Teeth. Wait. Clockwork teeth. Ah, I'm starting to suspect where this gift factory is. Heathcliff didn't know what she was talking about. And upon being called Clockhead, Dante reminded them that they are called Dante. Well, at least to those that can understand them. Crayon heard that the clockwork teeth looked like clocks. They also didn't show up that high. Oh, so, above a certain altitude, you're safe from them. Apparently, she didn't see a monster like that. And then Don Quixote told Crayon that Dante was not a monster. They're their manager. Dante thanked her for the intro. Crayon was confused by what was going on. As she not... Well... She could only understand the side of the conversation that wasn't Dante's. Don Quixote excused this, explaining that Dante has their reasons. Yeah, the fact that they don't have a vocal processor installed in that head... Then she asked if she's unharmed. 
Crayon was. She observed that the others dragged the, uh, well, dragged there with her were not so fortunate. Don Quixote was sympathetic towards this. She understood that they were neighbors from her village. Crayon was hopefully that. <coughs> Crayon was hopeful, rather, that soon their village will send hunters to save them. They'll get there as long as they're capable of doing so. Dante wanted to know more about these hunters, not knowing what she was talking about. They were about to ask more about this. Unfortunately, a gas was released. Heathcliff wanted to know what was going on. Don Quixote advised that they hold their breath. The red and green gas filled the room. Apparently, it was the same kind that Crayon was exposed to previously when she was taken. Dante was thankfully immune to it. Sadly, the others were not. Dante compared it to what happened in the branch facility in District 4, with the toxic gas. Thankfully, this time, the gas just knocked the bats. Dante then hid before a door opened, which was just as well as a crowd of gnomes rushed through it. Leafy said, Ome! Is that all that's left of furniture, Dodoro? Ome! Ome! All that talk of snagging free top-notch raw materials! And now look at him, Ome! A pile of meat, Ome! Then they sounded excited. Ome! 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 One Ome! Two Ome! Three Ome! All accounted for! I suppose, Ome. Leafy spoke of them being fast asleep with the sleepy powder, so they don't need to arm the good ones. Cherry told them to move the good ones. They picked them up and loaded them onto the sleigh. They left and closed the door behind them. Dante could do nothing but watch. It was now Dante's time to shine. They will rescue the three of them! Sadly, they didn't take Ishmael up on self-defense training. Dante didn't know what to do, reminded of the fact that on their own, they are completely useless. <sighs> Don Quixote and Heathcliff could at least be brought back if they were with Dante, but none of them were there. What good was Dante without the damned dozen. Dante understood that it was a miracle that they lasted that long and that far. Then Ishmael questioned this, telling them to get a hold of themselves. Dante thought this was an illusion. Then they saw Sinclair telling them that this was real. Roger asking if they even know what a mess it was on Mephistopheles when they realized that the three of them just vanished into thin air. Another door appeared, and the rest of them appeared. Dante was relieved. Then Leafy remembered the slightly spoiled ingredient, Ome. Realizing that Dante wasn't alone, Faust basically told them, tell us to fight... <sighs> Well, tell us how to fight first, explain later. Dante thanked everyone. How did they find them? Yi Sang told them that they entered via the back door. Their signals were no longer detected from within Mephistopheles, implying that they had... In fact, all of them had some form of tracker on them. As if Limbus Company doesn't feel safe unless they can't even take a without them knowing about it. I mean, is it a bomb that explodes if they go too far, killing them? Manly triggered? Well, for them it'd be a temporary setback. Or does it allow them to be tracked down in case they try to desert and they're forcefully taken back? Yi Sang told them that every sinner was 
immediately summoned from their rooms for the search. Rodia was annoyed by the fact that it was soon after the break started, asking Dante not to do something like that again. Rosis was unable to hold back her scathing criticism of Dante's rogue behaviour. No amount of suck-up mentality would prevent her from doing that. This posed too great a risk, asking them to be wary of that. Dante apologised for this, asking how they found them. Yisang deduced this. Heathcliff was in a constant state of uneasiness, considering that they were in the middle of the Great Lake. There was nothing that could be done before they arrived at District 20. On the day that the backdoor volatility siren echoed, Don Quixote made a relatively delayed return to the back door. The next day, she requested from him and Faust, an encyclopedia of common symbols used in the city. Faust lent her a few volumes. Yi Sang continued by explaining that ever since receiving the volumes, Don Quixote sat next to him and went through the pages enthusiastically. Yes, he couldn't talk to her about that. Due to him being prone to vomiting, more so than most, while they were still on the Great Lake. He did remember the words repeatedly used. Cosplay, costumes, sack. This was enough for him to, well, enough for him to figure out the symbols that caught her attention when the siren blared. Fast was aware of the door on which those symbols were drawn. Based on that, they could find them. <sighs> and wherever they went to. Masson engaged several gnomes on their path to that floor. And Rodier was relieved that they only ran into weaklings. Faust made it clear that at least one of them could have stayed dead. Dante felt awkward. Faust wanted them to... Well, wanted to make them understand that engaging hostile forces in Dante's absence carried an exceedingly high level of risk. Massot added that they could have been lost forever in some corner of the corridors, never to be retrieved or revived. Utis was harsher, still asking them to comprehend the weight of their responsibilities and the risk of that their independent action carries. She got closer and told them that they must survive, no matter what, asking if she made herself clear. Ooh, if she's not sucking up to Dante during this kind of situation, you know it's bad. Lutis had a gaze that was cold and ruthless. Faust considered that their survival was a lucky coincidence. Ah, as in what happens every day but shouldn't be trusted. Apparently the sequence of those symbols were not supposed to be interpreted in such a haphazard manner. Yet a blonde, insane girl was capable of doing so. Dante was sorry, they didn't know what to say. Faust saw this is enough. Ryushu said NDQ, or No Don Quixote. Oh, so she doesn't give a about Heathcliff. Ishmael noticed that Don Quixote and Heathcliff weren't there, asking where they were. Dante then explained what happened, and after that explanation... Gregor asked how they managed to survive that far. He decided not to say anything more, as the others did so already. So he got to the point with asking where they were. Ulitis wanted to know this as well. What district it was called, believing it to be one of the northern districts of the city. Apparently, they're known for being colder than most, or... According to Faust, they're not in the city. Gregor wanted to know what she meant. 
Faust then replied that they're not in the city, as they are gnomes, a species surviving in the outskirts. Yeah, that explains the mention of the clockwork teeth by Crayon. They were mentioned during Argalia, the blue sicko's interrogation of outskirts dwellers, who were squatting in the ruins of the lab that was attacked. That resulted in the deaths of Daniel, Kali, the Red Mist, and Garion, along with others. Yes, Garion being an arbiter sent to shut that lab down. As for Argalia, he wanted to learn more about what went down there. Thankfully, the clockwork teeth were no match for him, Pluto, yesterday's promise, and Ilin, the leader of the Church of Gears. Unfortunately, he was the kind of insane that would come out of Rouge's <laughs> Pluto was a cross between the Jin from Wishmaster and Mephisto from the Marvel Universe, and Ilin was a fangirl of Argalia, after he saved her, and she was the leader of the Church of Gears, after her father was killed by Roland, the Black <laughs> Stain. Yes, Pluto was screwed over by him with an unfavourable contract, and Argalia had a sister that was married to Roland, who was killed during the Pianist incident. Yeah. The outskirts are even worse than the back streets, and the clockwork teeth was a hint of where they were before. I mean, even before Faust made that clear, along with the gnomes being monsters. Rodio was disgusted at the thought of dealing with monsters again, after all that they faced at the Great Lake. Dante didn't see them as exactly as whales, as they could communicate with the gnomes, Similar to people, but smaller. Ishmael saw this as a different part of the outskirts. She would like to explore the area, if the circumstances permitted. Seeing that structure as custom-built for the gnomes, considering how small everything was in there. Hong Lu asked if that was the outskirts that they were in. Can they go back? Faust said yes, as long as the door that they remained <sighs> as long as the door that they entered remained open. Yes, English is claiming me again. Masalt saw it as open for now, but Sinclair was nervous as he asked what if it closed. Faust then made it clear that they'd have to make quite the journey. They'd need to travel the distance from where they were in the outskirts back into the city, which would require a lot of time and effort. Dante considered that dangerous, but before they could finish that thought, Shadowy asked, Where that sound came from, Mommy? And then noticed... Cherry noticed that too! Seeing them as striking gold, uh, seeing eleven live humans, Omi! Telling them to get their tool, Omi. Yisang told Dante to get to the back of the line. The door slammed open and gnomes began flooding into that room. They prepared for battle. After wiping out the immediate number of the gnomes, Ishmael saw how they could be seen as similar as humans, but they are certainly not humans. Although they do have an odd verbal quirk, they're impressively communicative. She's not exactly sure if they can be categorised as monsters. Faust considered the definition as arbitrary. Some call them monsters, other call them members of a different sentient race. Ishmael understood that. While Dante appreciated Faust's analyses, they really need to get moving, as they need to find Heathcliff and Don Quixote. Ortis considered how Dante could say the right things at the right time. Well, rather spectacular return to form after the, cri <laughs> the critical moments. Masson, 
saw that exploring the outskirts would carry higher risks than the usual operation grounds. To ensure Dante's safety, they needed to establish a more structured plan. Then Ishmael forced the door open. Ishmael saw that the easiest solution would be to leave the two of them, but the easiest path isn't always the right one. The gnomes then rushed in on them, and Ishmael told them that they should go. They'll protect Dante and save Mr. Anger Management and the Blonde Lunatic. After more gnomes were slaughtered, Rodia had some time to look around out there, and Yi Sang could identify that facility as a gift factory. Hong Lu was unusually serious, seeing that there are factories that produce gifts. Sinclair seeing Christmas decorations everywhere. Not a time that has positive associations to him, as that's when his family were killed by Cromer. Along with... Well, with the assistance of the hammer and nail that was in there. Although Sinclair mentioned that it was still some time before it was Christmas. Dante didn't need to ask to know what he was feeling, as they still remembered what happened at Ka. Hong Lu asked if monsters exchanged gifts with each other. Gregor didn't think so, as they didn't seem like the hospitable sort. Massot saw as a possibility that they might be contractors to one of the wings. Dante was tempted to say, no chance. But from what they've experienced of the city and the wings so far, they could see that it wasn't a possibility that they could write off completely. After more gnomes were forced in the attempt to acquire more material, along with the gift factory being systematically trashed, they soon realised that the conveyor belts were moving what wasn't your average gifts. Rodia asked if that was a foot, a sign with a drawing of a foot. What's that doing there? Yisang saw another one adorned with the sign of an eyeball, seeing them as being made from materials that don't normally go into building those items. They were able to make teddy bears, oil pastel boxes, toy trains. They have an abnormal, well, an abnormally high concentration of protein and phosphorus. Faust noting that the decorations and lights were made from proper materials, not made by rearranging the atoms or of organic material as these were likely salvaged from the waste material expelled from the city. Yes, it's made abundantly clear that the outskirts are the dumping ground for the waste of the city, along with any impurities. Ryushu... <sighs> Ryushu saw it as obvious. GMFH. Sinclair translated that as gifts made from humans. Roger felt uneasy about more stuff made from human sacrifice. The outskirts isn't so different from the city based on that. What was concerning to Ishmael was, who are these gifts for? Sinclair asked, who would want anything like that? Roger theorized that it could be the rich who had screwed up perversion. Hong Lu wanted to get them back on track, asking if they're making gifts out of people. In that case, Heathcliff and Don Quixote were intended to have gifts made from them as well. Dante mentioned something about them speaking of locally produced materials. Yi Sang understood that they needed to be quick about this. Masot found a location where they were most likely to be presuming that they've not been turned into gifts yet. After a long silence, he pointed in the direction of a placard that said, Gift Assembly. 
Dante thought that they heard an odd noise from a particular direction. Ryushu concurred. It was a rather high-pitched SOS, which was always a good indicator of wonderful happenings. Which in her case meant that she was expecting bloodshed about to happen. Sinclair was unnerved by Ryushu giggling at the force of sounds of screaming. Which is what she was saying before asking her not to do that. Masalt was, well, familiar with this tone. The decibel range of that screaming was an exact match of Don Quixote. Yeah, he can tell that. Utis noted that they've yet to conduct a threat assessment of the combat area. It appears to be a closed-off space, which meant... Yisang then told her that where Heathcliff was with them, he would have said as such. Utis asked what would he say. Dante had an idea. They said, How bloody frustrating! Quit whinging! Pick up the tools and get cracking! Ishmael considered that impression of an unsophisticated hothead to be pretty close to accurate. And she decided to act as if she was leading a squad of police raiding a building, and kicked the door open. Meanwhile, Heathcliff was awake and disoriented, not knowing where they were, asking why they were tied up. Don Quixote told him that they were quite screwed. They were going to be made into toys in that hydraulic press. When the time came, she'd be turned into a roly-poly toy, and Heathcliff told her to shut her trap and do something. They've got to get out of their blinds. Don Quixote apologised. She admitted to her selfishness when she wanted to get the red sack cosplay for herself, but it wasn't a lie that she wanted to find an impeccable outfit for him. This Heathcliff off, knowing this was going to happen, threatening to do something when he's out of those binds. But Don Quixote was sobbing, telling him that he'd at least become an elaborate pocket watch. Oh, so he'll look nicer. Which irritated him with clocks appearing again. Crayon was being turned into a box of coloured pencils. Twenty-four vibrant colours, according to the description. Cherry hasn't seen living raw materials in the wild, Ome. Shadowy complains that they're a bit loud, Ome. Asking if they could see if their ears were bleeding, Ome. Leafy told them, Ome, the more they scream, the happier their recipients will be, Ome. Cherry then said, Ome, Ome, the next get cutting, Ome. Then we get to the door kicking of Ishmael. Sinclair called for Heathcliff and Don Quixote finding it a relief that they've not been turned into gifts yet. Ryushu found it quite cosy in there. Don Quixote was surprised and relieved to see everyone. Heathcliff wanted to know how... Dante told him that they're there for him. Heathcliff shared Don Quixote's surprise and relief. They got there not a moment too soon. Heathcliff was about to be shoved into the hydraulic press. Yi sang had honed his straps, well, hewn his straps, rather, so he can descend. Heathcliff was about to be unusually open about his feelings after he was saved from being turned into a pocket watch, wanting to thank them, but... Otis called them both absolute idiots. They had one job, to remain by Dante's side, yet they let themselves be captured like that. Heathcliff then changed his mind. Ishmael told them to get a hold of themselves. Then she asked Dante, What now? Dante decided that they were going to trash this place, telling them to get their... Well, get ready to wear their identities as they've got some gnomes to... up. After they defeated the horde of gnomes... Don Quixote and Heathcliff fell to their knees before everyone, understanding what they were about to receive. 
Dante also did the same, but Ortis pulled them to the side, either not knowing that they okayed this or didn't care if they did. Dante felt bad for those two. Don Quixote told Ortis that she was ready. Ortis then called those two absolute buffoons, asking them how did they ever think that this was going to turn out okay? Asking if they were even aware of the risks Dante took to get there. How worried they were about those two. When Heathcliff was about to tell her that Dante was in on it from the start, Ortis shouted, Silence! Largely because that insolent fool referred to Dante with such derogatory language. Don Quixote was terrified of this, repeatedly saying that it was her fault. Massol was apparently scolded by his mother in his youth. Rutus didn't slow her stern scoldings. The pair fell silent by the end of this, and their heads hung low. Dante decided to wander away from that scene. The guilt from this was too much to bear. Dante then asked if Crayon was okay. Faust confirmed that she was. She merely fainted from the excess psychological shock. Yi Sang asked her how she found herself at a place such as that. Ishmael asked if she was a human and she's really from the outskirts. The deluge of questions made Crayon taken aback, but she soon... <coughs> sorry, she soon opened up. She was amazed that they were really from the city. She revealed that she's from Cloudtown, a village on the north side of the outskirts. So, yeah, they're definitely on the other side of the map. It would take them at least half a year for them to meet up with Mephistopheles assuming that Mephistopheles would drive in that general direction to make sure that they catch up. Gregor asked if there was a lot of monsters like those gnomes out there that can speak. Crayon confirmed this. There were many besides the gnomes. She saw a few of them herself. The village elders told her about the rest. Cloudtown was built to keep the monsters out, to keep them safe. If this didn't happen, they'd be, well, they'd be preparing dinner back at the village by now. Gregor understood that the gnomes raided her village. Crayon then mentions that she was a victim of her own bad timing much like the others, as they were attacked when the hunters were gone. They didn't normally get raided by the gnomes around that time of year, so they thought that they were safe. But the gnomes suddenly attacked them, rushing in on their sleighs. Some of the Cloud Town inhabitants tried to fight, but they didn't stand a chance, and... They all got killed. They got shoved into the sacks on their sleigh. The main reason why she was alive was because she passed out from fright and then got shoved into the sacks of the others as they thought she was dead too. Gregor then realized that they forced her to talk about something that wasn't easy to speak of, apologizing for that. Crayon asked, well, she said it was okay as she had questions to ask as well. And Gregor let her ask. Crayon asked if the crayon boxes in the city had 48 different colours and they had gold and silver ones too. Gregor said they probably did, although he didn't know for certain. Crayon then asked if there were just people in the city, no monsters like the gnomes that try to kill them. Rodia answered by saying that it's hard to, well, answer that. Well, considering that the monsters in the city often wear human face, where humans prey on other humans, on both sides of the law, then there's the distortion that has occurred relatively recently. Ah. Huh. Yes, they prey on the population as well. Well, 
Anyway, Crayon sometimes climbs a high hill to look at the city, seeing pretty colourful lights from up there. So colourful that she doesn't have enough colours in her crayon set to draw them all. Well, it's certainly not in direct view of District 9, as that's on the eastern part of the city. Ro- well, Roland mentioned the light show at that nest, although that district likely doesn't have a monopoly on that kind of architecture. Crayon wished that she could live in the city. If she lived there, she'd not have to worry about getting attacked by monsters. She could live happily with all her neighbours. Uh-huh. She clearly doesn't know that it's not much better in the city. Between the syndicates, the sweepers, and the distortions, the people there have about as much optimism about the future as a cryptocurrency investor after finding out that their investor has went belly up. And they've lost all their money that they invested. Rodia understood that she's never been to the city. Ryushu said, SSE. This confused Crayon. Ryushu said, Same story everywhere. Doesn't matter where you are, death always stalks them. Crayon thought that was so cool, wanting Ryushu to say it again. This confused Dante. Crayon asked if there was anyone else nearby. Ishmael didn't see any other humans besides her. According to Crayon, he had to be there to save them. Honglu asked who she meant. Crayon mentioned that he was the best hunter in Cloud Town. If he was there, the gnomes wouldn't have... Yisang understood that in the outskirts there were hunters who specialised in hunting monsters, much like the whalers of the Great Lake. Then Roger said, Wait. If they're kidnapping and killing humans for those gifts, who are the gifts for? Then a fat, demonic-looking being that resembled a big man with a huge belly and a big beard, saying, Well, this (sighs) fat, demonic being said, Ho, ho, ho. Of course. Those gifts are for the poor neighbors who do not cry. Utis advised Dante to retreat. Dante didn't know when it happened, but a large shadow was looming over them. Roger asking what that thing was. He said that he was Sadata, bringer of gifts to their neighbors. Ho, ho, ho. The guffawing giant, garbed in red, carried a massive gift sack on his shoulder. He was definitely not human. Heathcliff referred to that git as the boss of the gift factory. Don Quixote also noticed the crimson garb that she spoke of. Heathcliff asked if that was the red sack's outfit. Then he's already... Don Quixote cried out that the reindeer man was killed too. Ursus told them to cut the useless chatter for once. After that short, stern command, she approached Dante and spoke in a low voice that she recommended that she attempt to parley with Santata, as he's clearly part of an intelligent species, although she understands that they'd best prepare for battle just in case talks fail. Dante saw this as a good idea. Ishmael asked what Santata meant by neighbours. Wings? Clients of the city? He said, Ho, ho, ho. They're denied entry to the city. Radia asking if Santata is a gnome as well. Don Quixote overheard that the gnomes referred to him as a beard giant, so she believes that he's not a gnome. Gregor was fascinated by the varieties of monsters in the outskirts. Rodia asked if Santata was an abnormality. Dante said no. He's not an abnormality, 
nor is he a distortion. He's closer to the whales. Santata said, Ho ho, do they still yearn for gifts too? Yet their kind already owns all there is to own. They and their neighbours in the outskirts. Wished so dearly for that very day. The only day that they're allowed joy and comfort in human gifts. Nassau understood that they produce toys out of humans and gift them to those that harbour hatred for humans. Out of pure goodness for... Well, of, from their hearts. Santata saw those who have been marginalized and exiled by humans gather and wallow there. They pour their infinite hatred and care into packaging those gifts. Ho, ho, ho. Utis understood this to be the long version of saying, I refuse to negotiate. Santata said at that point, Ho, ho, ho. Why don't you come there and join them? Because joy to those who need it. Yes, become it. As in, become gifts. Yeah, that's going to happen. Do you really think they're going to go down without a fight? They were then forced to fight this beard giant known as Sadtata who, despite his appearances, is not related to the abnormality Rudolta, who was a twisted, stitched-up abomination made of Santa, Rudolph, and the sleigh, by a particularly petty and spiteful child. Nor is it related to Sandolf, an aberration of Rudolta, whose EGO is Holiday. To end this terror of the northern outskirts, they would need to kill him. this monster. While fighting Santata, they needed to deal with a lot of blunt force trauma. He also gained poise upon successfully hitting his targets, which if triggered increases the critical hit damage that he dealt. He can also slow them down, which with one attack that he had would cause five SP to be lost on the hit, and if a critical hit was gained, it would cause paralysis. He can also generate charge, which he uses on an attack which, if it hits the target, generates poise, increased damage, a random effect on the target, and SP lost equivalent to the amount of charge gathered and can cause all to lose 10 SP if that target is killed. But if the attack fails, then he gains paralysis. He can also defend himself, which if the shield HP is depleted, he's staggered. If there's some left, he can be one that can hit harder on the next turn. Morale has an effect on him as well. The lower it is, the more damage he can deal, at the cost of being able to be damaged more. He can gain poise with the Ho-Ho-Ho status, which is gained if he has 10 or more charge, or has 30% or lower core HP. He loses the Ho-Ho-Ho status if, well, if staggered, and when hit by an attack. He also loses poise if, if he's hit. And his hits become weaker if the gift sack is broken. The damned doesn't also figure out that piercing attacks worked best against this one. They persevered and then killed the giant. Okay, so the giant is dead. What next? Well, I'll save that for the next video. Until next time. Hail the rabbits!